Laodicea, the name actually means rights of the people. This really describes this age, doesn't it? Especially in our, this country, we are, uh, church to us is, what do I get out of it? Now, I don't go to church to, to, uh, to put in, I, I want to go to church to see what I can get. In fact, I don't want to get involved in anything unless I get something out of it, right? Laodicea means the rights of the people. Historically, we talked about this um, several weeks ago about the uh, the history of Laodicea. So um, you can go back and look at some of that. But historically, the city of Laodicea was a uh, had uh, made great progress in med- medicine. But when we're talking about the, this church age that it represents, it seems like faith in medicine replaced faith in God's healing. Here is a whole. The last hundred years have been flooded. Maybe not so much as now as, as during those, the forties, the fifties, the six, I mean, tremendous, tremendous healings. Tremendous evangelists would go through. They would, uh, whole cities would convert, you know, whole towns would convert to God. But now today, when anything, and I'm guilty of this myself, when, when anything medically goes wrong, we seek the doctor. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I mean, thank God for doctors. If not, I probably would be dead. But that's not God's best. And we think about, how many have heard about the um, the chip they want to put in you uh, in this country? In, the, in, the, in a few years, they want to put a chip in you, underneath your skin and it will be required for you to have that chip because all the medical records will be associated with that chip. And so if you don't have the chip, if you don't let them put it in, you, you can't get any medical treatment. And, of course, they came up with the Obamacare, so, so everybody would be under the same, you know, under the same system. And so, and you know, they stress that everybody had to have digital records. A lot of people have thought, well, you know, I don't want to get that chip. I think that's, you know, it's kind of, kind of freaky. I don't want to get no chip because, of, you know, it may, what, what if it's the mark of the beast? But here's something to be assured, uh, that assur- is assuring to us. Before there were doctors, before there were medicine, there was God. Yep. And even though we tend to rely on this stuff, don't think that we need it, that we absolutely need it. We all have our drugs, our pharmaceuticals that we have to take. But do we really absolutely have to take it, or is it just that God uses it because it's there? And if it wasn't there, he would do something else. I know a, a, a lot of people warn about the, the end times coming. They say that you should, you should have uh, food stored in your, in your home and water and all this extra food enough to uh, uh, maybe to survive for years through the tribulation. First of all, I'm not going to be in the tribulation. I don't know about you. I'm not saving up food to go through seven years of tribulation because I'm leaving. But I'm reminded, I mean, I'm, I'm foolish enough to believe that when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, 40 years they walked around in the desert. Forty years they wandered in the desert. And there was no food. How did they eat? Miracle. God supplied manna from heaven and quail. And he supplied it miraculously. What about Jesus? Remember, in the day of Jesus, didn't there was like 5,000 people and there was one child had a, brought a lunch. Maybe he had a sardine sandwich. Sardine. I think my translation said a sardine, tra- I don't know what your translation said. It said some bread and some fishes, right? That's a sardine sandwich. But anyway, Jesus multiplied it. And then there was, <laughs> it started with one sardine sandwich or tuna fish, right? He fed 5,000 people which might have been up to 10,000 if it was 5,000 men. Then you would have had their wives and the children, right? It could have been up to 10,000 people. And then when it was all done, he filled up 12 baskets of remaining fragments of that sandwich. How did that happen? Because God is not bound 
by science. God is not bound by matter. In fact, I think the way the reason they call it matter is because it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, maybe that's a way, way to remember. Matter doesn't really matter to God. God can do nothing is impossible for God. So I'm not storing up food. I'd rather be storing up prayer. I'd rather be storing up the word. I'm worried, the only famine I'm worried about is the one where it says there's coming a famine in the land, a famine of hearing the word of God. And I'm doing my best to make sure that the word is going out. Because that, I mean, I'm not telling you to do it, I'm just saying that because I believe that's what God would have me to do, to have the word going out. Because there's coming a time where there will be an attack against the word like we've never seen before. And everything that we're talking about tonight, you won't even be able to talk tonight. You think you got all this stuff out there on YouTube and, hey, we live in a wonderful time. There's all this gospel out there on the internet and it's free, but there's coming a time where it's going to be zipped, it's going to be taken away. In Laodicea was known, they pioneered the field of ophthalmology. Now contrast this with this church age, which I see, they this church age has pioneered the field of theological blindness. Well, what does that mean? They, there are We have so many schools, so many Bible colleges, so many seminaries, and yet they're destructive. They're not teaching you to, to walk by faith and to trust the Bible. They're teaching you all these things not to trust the Bible. How many have a Bible and it has footnotes in your Bible? With little little comments that causes, when you read the footnote, it causes you to have unbelief. Oh, this didn't really appear in this other manuscript. Some translations leave these verses out. I didn't know how bad it was when I was looking at a translation. It says, you look right at the verses, verse 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, 11. What? What happened to the ones in the middle? They're gone. They've been deleted with a footnote. And I found out that most of the time when there's a footnote in the Bible, it's probably to give you unbelief. I it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's almost unbelievable until you see it with your eyes. Anyway, pioneering the field of theological blindness. Uh, they were uh, world, the Laodicea was world renowned for this glossy black wool. And you know how Jesus just got through telling the church to, to be uh, clothed with the white garments, right? The white garments represent the, the righteousness of the saints. And I said, it contrasts this with the church being comfortable clothed in black garments. And again, I think that goes back to this idea of, I know it says repent, but I don't really know that that is talking to me. Surely God doesn't expect me to do that. Whatever that is to you. Historically, Laodicea was the richest commercial center of the world. Contrast this with this church age is the, the I mean, this is a fact, it's the richest church in history. 2,000 years of Christianity, and we live in the time where the church is the richest church that we've ever had. The wealthiest, great wealth among Christian community. And yet, look at today's church tragedy. 94% of Americans claim to believe in God in this country. Yet, Americans spend six times more dollars on their pets than on foreign missions. You see where the priority is. Well, but that's, that's, my, that's my dog. Or that's my cat. And there's nothing wrong with taking care of your dog or your pet. But you see where the, Jesus called us to reach the world. And foreign missions, we, sh we should be supporting foreign missions. And there's usually not enough. And I, I'm, I'm amazed in, in churches how when you get down through the budget, there's no more left for foreign missions. We should at least support one, right? It's also in a time period where World War II came about. Well, what, what, what's so significant about, significant about World War II? Well, we brought up last week World War I happened during that during that uh, Philadelphia age, and, and also it would uh, apply here as well. Um, World War I was a turning event, and it was at the exact time, the exact year was prophesied in the Bible when the Antichrist kingdom would begin rising, the final 
Antichrist kingdom would begin rising, and then it would come to its completion. But this stuff wasn't secret. It was all planned. And it all, and you can see, well, here's World War II, 1939, 1945. What was God doing in World War I, World War II? A big shaking of the world to get everybody to realize, hey, this is the end. And people say, oh, you know, they've been saying the end's coming, the end's coming for, you know, 100 years. It never changes. I mean, yeah, God's giving you a lot of time. One thing, you, one thing you can't accuse God when you stand in front of him in judgment, say, I didn't know. How many have never heard of World War I or World War II? How many have never heard of World War III? I'll tell you, it's coming. There'll be one more to warn us before, before the grand finale. But it's God's way of shaking the world. And saying, hey, get yourself straight. The end is here. During World War II, of course, there was one individual that uh, that stood out. Um, Adolf Hitler, a lot of people during that time believed he was the biblical Antichrist. And it's, it's interesting here. Here's, here's some facts about, about Hitler and his association with the scriptural identification of Antichrist. Uh, and we, we have him listed there at the top on the right-hand side. He had an insignificant beginning, which is prophesied in Daniel 8 and 9. He was a political and military leader. All these refer to Antichrist, and yet Adolf Hitler kind of fit the role. Uh, he had a propaganda minister, Goebbels. Uh, uh, propaganda minister is nothing different than a false prophet. Uh, kind of help him rule. He had Rome as an ally, Mussolini. He persecuted the Jews for seven years, which is what the Antichrist is going to do, a seven-year tribulation, right? And that's from Daniel 9, 27. Uh, the last three and a half years was by far the worst persecution, which is the same thing we have, same picture we have for the tribulation. Hitler tattooed a number on the Jews', Jews body, giving them both a mark and a number. Hitler had his own mark, the cross and the swastika. In fact, when you see that, how many, if you see swastika, you don't have to see anything else, you think Adolf Hitler. Nazi Germany, right? The mark, it's like embedded in your, in your mind. That's how much the mark of the Antichrist in, in, that's coming, his mark will be so clear to the people, and yet they will willingly, by hordes, go out and get that mark. I'm glad, yes, we can. I'm glad I'm not going to be here. I, but you do have to make a choice. You know, if you want to go downtown Chicago, you got to make a choice to get a train ticket. And you also got to make sure you're there when the train leaves. Yeah. Because if you say, well, I'm going to go downtown and the train leaves at 7 in the morning and you're there at 7.15, guess what? You're still there. You're, you're way, that train didn't wait for you. And God's not waiting for you. The train is coming. I'm talking about the train that's going up to heaven. The train is coming and you better get your ticket. And just having the ticket's not enough. You better be there when the train comes. I always talk about the, 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 uh, the ten virgins. Five were foolish, five were, the five that were wise were ready. They were all virgins waiting for the Lord to come. But not everybody went. Then Hitler's body was ended up being thrown into a burning fire. Which is the same thing. You look in the Revelation, it says that the Antichrist will be thrown into the lake fire. Now, I'm not saying Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. The Antichrist is yet to come. But he was a very good picture of what Antichrist will be. And what the tribulation, tribulation will be like. Except for Nazi Germany was very limited. 6,000 Jews were killed, or 6 million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. But now turn that up to a world scale. You're going to have basically the same thing, only the whole world is involved, right? In fact, it brings us in the next slide, the, uh, the, this Holocaust. And uh, we don't have to look at a lot of, a lot of uh, pictures there, but uh, just seeing those pictures kind of is very distasteful, isn't it? And another thing that happens, happens in this time period, this last church age, the state of Israel is born. 
Israel, the focus of Old Testament and end time prophecy, finally becomes established, reestablished, reemerges in our world in 1948. And yet, as we brought up last week, 90 some percent of the church, maybe 95 percent, I forget what I said last time, I'm just, you know, throwing out the statistic here, based upon what I understand about the church, but most people deny that this, that Israel really has anything to do with the Bible. These are church going people, and it's not because they're stupid. And many, they may be much smarter than you. They're just going to the wrong place and hearing the wrong message because in the pulpit, they're not preaching anymore the sure word of prophecy. Something else is what, what they, they would rather have. We have the state of Israel being born, but look how the church reacts. In 1948, we also had a formation of the World Council of Churches. And you can see every different flavor of Christianity there. And here's the thing I could never understand. If we're all reading the same book, why do we have all these different ones? Do you want to know how confusing it is? Now, if you're raised in the church, it's a whole lot different. Because you think you know what you know. But if you're not raised in the church, let's say you're Muslim. How, how could you ever make sense out of the church? They all say, oh, yeah, we follow Christ, but they all do something different. Where do all these flavors come from? And if you go to the church and listen to what's taught at the pulpit, you will hear completely different flavors of messages. And if, if you're used to hearing the truth, you would go, oh, my, my goodness. This doesn't sound anything like the truth. In fact, good luck if, if they even read the scripture. And if they do, they'll twist it and turn it. They, they're not... They're not telling you, you the word of God is the inspired word of God. It is salvation. Without the word, there is no salvation. In fact, Jesus is the word. John's gospel says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. John, John's gospel is like Genesis to me. They both start out the same way. In the beginning... Right? In the beginning, God created heaven. In the beginning was the Word. In fact, if you get a chronological Bible, you know what? They put that verse of John right next to that verse in Genesis. Because at the, beginnings, at the beginning is the beginning, right? They both have to happen at the beginning. But this World Council of Churches, this would seem like a good thing. Like, oh, let's all get together. And we'll all work together. To what end? To spread the gospel of Christ or to spread whatever we, whatever we come up with? The only thing that matters to God as far as the word going forth is that it's his word. If it's not his word, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't save. It doesn't, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't accomplish anything. It's got to be... His word. Here's something else that happened around that same time. Anybody recognize this character? Now, you might think this is funny, but it's not really funny if, if, you're, if you're living out there without God. There's a lot of people that really believe in this. There's a lot of people that will claim and swear to you that they've been abducted. That they've had things shafted up their eyes and you know, your nose and in their eyes and, and all over. I don't know if it happened or not, but... but I, now I believe, maybe, maybe a little different than most of you, because I read this scripture that says that Jesus said, right at the end time, it'll be like the days of Noah. One thing that happened in the days of Noah, you go back and you look at Genesis chapter 6, and you read this story, and you'll find out the reason the flood happened is that right before that, he says, there came a time where the sons of God descended upon the earth. They took flesh upon themselves. Angels had, you can see angels popping up throughout the Old Testament, and they appeared in human form. They were able to take human bodies, and they actually had relations, and they had offsprings, and the giants came from these offspring. It says that the giants came out of the, the union with human women and, and, uh, and angels. Now, I don't know if it went the other way around, Maybe, the, maybe it went the other way around as well. I don't know. 
But these, these beings, these hybrid beings were created. And Jude, is he Jude or Peter? One of them talks about the, these, these beings that uh, were disobedient in the day of Noah. They were put in Tartarus, which is a prison just for angelic beings. Not hell, not the lake of fire, not the bottomless pit. Tartarus is a special place reserved, a prison for these disobedient ones. But anyway, I think these aliens may just be exactly what Jesus said in the days of Noah. Uh, just like in the days of Noah, so should the days of the Son of Man be. I think these, some of the, now a lot of these stories are probably false and hoax. And, but maybe these creatures are out there. I don't know. But I wouldn't put it past Satan. And, you know, we, we, we've studied the scripture where it says that Satan appears like an angel of light. People are looking for answers. And if they don't have the answers from God, if someone appears, just in your mind's eye, in imagination, just imagine tomorrow. How many, how many ever saw the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still? Think back at it, and I'm talking about the original one, the black and white one. One day, all of a sudden, this, this UFO just lands. What if that happens tomorrow? It does say that Satan, woe, woe, woe to you upon the earth, because Satan has been cast down. When he is cast down, how is he going to make his entrance? Is it going to be invisible, or is he going to make a big display? Is he going to come down in some type of a ship and come out? And people will want to know the wisdom of these space travelers. And we have been groomed to, to, to receive it, to, to go after it, right? right? All this Star Trek and Star Wars, and, and somehow we got the idea that if they're out there, if they're these space, space beings, that they must be smarter than us. And yet every movie you go to, it, it shows that these aliens are always trying to kill you <laughs> or eat you, right? right? This picture up here is when, uh, in Roswell, when supposedly the spaceship crashed in 1940, it was 47, I think. And uh, you can see on the side here, now the, these, are, um, these are dummies in the museum there at Roswell, uh, this is supposedly based upon eyewitnesses. There was actually a, uh, when we went there, we talked to the uh, surgeon who supposedly did the, um, oh, what do you call it, when you, when you uh, the autopsy on, the, on this creature. Now, I don't know uh, whether he did or not, whether he was lying or not. He claims, I mean, he's a surgeon, you would think he would be somewhat trustworthy, but he claimed that they, in the middle of the night they had him do an autopsy on this, this one that uh, they pulled out of the wreck. Supposedly there was four of them, three of them were dead, and one was still alive, and they took him to Washington, D.C. And uh, it's amazing how much the progress we've made since... You know, he came into contact with this guy. But, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, if it is the devil or some, some fallen angel behind this, think about how long they've lived. Would they not have intelligence and wisdom? And I mean, they would know things that we didn't know. We, we better not be taken in on this because... Again, Satan appears like an angel of light to deceive. We've talked a little bit about, well, actually we talked a lot about apparitions of Mary. They're still happening. We talked about happening in the past, but here in 1961 through 65, there were, look at this, there were 2,000 appearances of Mary in Garbandal, Spain. And the message that she speaks through these apparitions, and this, the, on both pictures, that is the apparition, by the way. This is the way she appears. It's really there, and, and uh, uh, there were 2,000 different appearances on, on different occasions here, but the message that Mary brings is always the same, a call to unity for all Jews, Christians, and Muslims. One church. Let's have one religion. One size fits all. 
But you know what? Christianity never claims or purports that we're supposed to have one religion. In fact, the Bible's very clear. There's no salvation in any other. So as far as the world's concerned, well, you can believe in Buddha and you can believe in Muhammad. But if <laughs> the scriptures say if you don't believe in Jesus, you don't, you're, not in, you're not in the fold. There's uh, three things here on the left here, messages from the apparition. Uh, she said, let people be united into one religion. Let the people look to Mary as their source of peace, hope, and salvation. And let Mary and the rosary bring unity and peace to the world. Uh, the, the Pope there, um, I think that's Pope John Paul down there on the right. Uh, he had made the comment, he said, the only way to save the world from war is the same from atheism, and it is the conversion of Russia to Fatima. In Catholicism, by the way, the uh, Mary, there is no salvation without going through Mary. In fact, um, the way they teach is that um, when you die, you uh, unless you're really a good person, you're really saintly, whatever that is, um, you go to purgatory. And unless Mary comes and gets you out of purgatory, you're going to stay there. And, and there is no purgatory in the Bible. But, um, yeah, so you don't want to offend her or anything. It, what it is, it's completely, completely made up. And so you have to decide what are you going to believe. Are you going to believe what the apparition says, or are you going to believe what the Word of God says? See, so you always have to go back to what, what, which one are you going to believe? You can believe the World Council of the Churches and what they want to do, or you can believe your Bible. You can believe what your pastor says on Sunday morning, or you can believe the Bible. And if the pastor says something that's not in the Bible, you don't have the courage just to go up and have a discussion with him. You, know, you don't have to make a big scene out of it. That's not even right to make a big scene. Just go one-on-one -on -one and say, you know, I'm confused about something. Maybe it's my misunderstanding. But the Bible says this, and I heard you say this, and you know maybe you know maybe he'll he'll say, oh man, I didn't even I didn't even know how that wasn't even supposed to come out that way. Which you know we all make mistakes, right? We're all human. Or maybe he'll, if you have the opportunity to say, yeah, but see what you what you don't understand is this one. So this scripture says this. This says this. This says this. Then when you get the whole picture, then you can say, oh, now I can see. Well, we've got to make a choice. God gave us his word. And there is nothing more important, no revelation more important than his word.